This picture shows King's Lynn around 1950, painted by Walter Dexter. He extolled the historic and architectural character of King's Lynn, frequently painting it across the water from the southwest, as seen here. This was Lynn at a glance, a view he described as both exceptional and arresting. Here was a splendid historic built environment, springing from the wealth generated by Lynn's overseas and coastal trade since the 12th century. The waterfront has changed a great deal since Dexter painted in the 1940s and 1950s, but the twin towers of the Minster Church watch over the Great River as they have done for centuries. Since 1951, the festival and the beautiful historic buildings of King's Lynn have been superbly interlocked. This is a festival town. Here is St George's Guildhall in King Street in 1951, following its restoration one of the largest medieval guild halls in England. It was built by Lynn's merchants in the 1420s. The 1951 festival was a celebration of the rebirth of St George's Guildhall as a community theatre and art centre. Its impact was such that all participants determined to continue with an annual summer feast of music and the arts, which attracted performers of national and international renown. Lady Fermoy's connections in the arts world was a critical advantage. Not only did she play the leading role in the organisation of the festival as its committee chairperson, but performed as an accomplished pianist in 12 concerts between 1951 and 1969. She retired from both roles in 1975. This portrait of Ruth Lady Fermoy was painted in 1954 by Anthony Divas. It was commissioned in recognition of her outstanding contribution to the festival and cultural life of West Norfolk. Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother, with Ruth Lady Fermoy at the Guildhall in July 1970 during the 20th Kingsland Festival. The Queen Mother was festival patron for 50 years. The festival committee in 1951 organised a committed band of stewards, flower arrangers, programme sellers and other volunteers. Sponsors, both corporate and individual, as well as the Borough Council, have all been key supporters of the festival since the 1950s. The opening ceremony was broadcast live by BBC Radio to emphasise how this was seen as a significant national event. No public building in England can claim a longer association with the drama. The first recorded play here was in 1445. The evidence is, moreover, compelling that Shakespeare acted in the Guildhall with the Earl of Pembroke's men in 1592. At this time, the hall may have been used as a tennis court, as well as a playhouse. No material evidence of the Tudor interior remains. Post-1660, the hall was rented by various companies of travelling players during the February Mart, as well as functioning as a courthouse. An Elizabethan-style theatre was built inside the hall for £450 in 1766, and the regional urban and rural gentry journeyed by horse and carriage to this Comedia House. England's most famous Shakespearean actors played here until the building was sold by the corporation in 1814 to become a wool warehouse. This shows Richard Southern's 1949 detailed model of the Georgian Playhouse erected in the hall in 1766. Substantial evidence consisted of a proscenium plaster ceiling supported upon six timber uprights, and the rain-making machine above it was in perfect working order, who was given access to the hall in 1949. Since 1917, it had served as the workshop of the scenic artists George Bridges and Son, who had received commissions from theatres and exhibitions nationwide. St George's Courtyard and the Garden on the River Beyond became favourite assembly and exhibition spaces in the annual festival from 1951. July exhibitions were held in the Guildhall Undercroft until the Fermi Gallery was opened in the historic warehouses running down to the river in 1963. It was named in memory of Lord Fermoy. Artworks and pictures of European as well as local significance have been on display here in July and August over the decades. The conversion costs of this part of the warehouse range were met by the Fermoy family. 
1965 and 1966, the remainder of the warehouse range was repaired by the trustees who secured public grants. The National Trust, for example, supplied 3,000 red tiles. St George's Guildhall is currently leased by Kings Lynn and West Norfolk Borough Council from the National Trust. Funding is being sought to once again restore the Guildhall complex as a theatre and arts venue in association with community groups with an interest in its successful future. We're in St George's Guildhall, which is the, um, the origins of the festival are here, and not far from me to my left is a plaque to Alec Penrose somebody I've always admired. He was in Kings Lynn in 1945 for the general election, but he happened to come into this building and was alarmed to discover it might be demolished. And he was a theatre historian and he decided to buy the property. In 1946, he paid £4,000 for the hall, not for the warehouses as well, just for the hall. And he set up a trust called the St George's Art Trust to um, carry out, he hoped would carry out, a restoration project if the money could be found. That was in 1948. Sadly, Alec Penrose died in 1950, so he didn't live long enough to see the complete restoration. But he knew it was going to happen by then, and he decided, and it was affected in 1951, it would go into the hands of the um, custodianship of the National Trust. So, sadly, Alec Penrose died just before he saw the completion of this project. Fortunately, I think in the Corn Exchange during the count of the election of 45, I think he'd spoken to Lady Ruth Fermoy about the project and she was enthusiastic. He won her support and she became the um, chairperson of the St George's Arts Trust, which he'd set up in 1948. And um, she, with um, a group of other people, began the began the challenge of raising the money to restore the hall. The British Arts Council, the Pilgrim Trust, and other grants came, from, came nationally, and also contributions from friends and supporters in Kings Lynn and beyond. Her husband, um, Lord Morris Fermoy, um, even went to America. He went to um, our sister city in New England, United States, called Lynn, Massachusetts, and then he raised a considerable amount of money for a hundred guineas. You could have your name on the back of the seat during the opening ceremony and other special occasions. And on the 24th of July, 1951, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth um, opened the building, opened the restored building. Um, Ruth Vermoy had been her lady in waiting. It was a wonderful occasion. Kings Lynn, in the difficult years after the war, when all towns, not least Kings Lynn, found the future challenging. But Kings Lynn had actually restored a medieval building as a community theatre and art centre. It was a very bold move in 1950, 51 to do such a thing. Well, it was also Kings Lynn's contribution to the Festival of Britain in 1951. And the festival in July 1951 was simply a celebration of the restoration of the building. It wasn't, in the beginning, designed to be a festival to carry on year after year. The Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings were asked to do a survey and they said, if you restore your buildings, it's not the whole answer, but if you restore your historic buildings, they're of national importance, the churches and the guild halls of Kings Lynn and the merchant houses. If you do this, you'll get visitors, you'll enhance your image, it will help the regeneration. And it worked because after 25 years, the Kings Lynn Festival was known home and abroad widely. It was acclaimed as a, a national and international festival with some of the most famous artists in the world appearing at it. What, what an achievement that had been, led by Ruth Vermoy, but behind Ruth Vermoy, as she always acknowledged, was a whole community. You know, So to understand more about um, Kings Lynn Festival and its success and its character, you have to go on a tour of these buildings. The origin of the festival is in this building. This is the spiritual home of the festival. It has so much atmosphere. It has so much, um, the, 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 the legacy here, the, the festival legacy. But remember this, the festival has always looked forward. The Corn Exchange was built in 1854 as an indoor hall for merchants and farmers. It accommodated a busy weekly market which began to decline when the cattle market in the town centre was closed in 1971. Fewer farmers came up to town on Tuesdays. 
The classical style has been described as jolly and vulgar. Its generous space made it an important venue for festival concerts both before and after its remodelling and upgrading in 1996. In 1951, the Corn Exchange hosted five concerts and orchestras of global prominence from home and abroad have played here. At the 60th festival in 2010, the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra played at the prestigious final night concert. The CBSO, as it is known, whose first conductor was Edward Elgar, celebrated its centenary in 2020. Another memorable event was Stars of the Bolshoi Ballet in 1999. In 1988, the West Norfolk Jubilee Youth Orchestra and Concert Band performed at the Corn Exchange on its 10th anniversary. A progressive pop concert was held in the Corn Exchange in the 1970 festival, which might be seen as a forerunner of Festival 2, which began in 1985. Its big open-air and free concerts on the Tuesday Marketplace included Alan Price in 1990 and Leo Sayer in 1999. Festival 2 has inherited the festival fireworks display from the banks of the Great Ouse, which remains a spectacular and popular event. The Duke's Head is an imposing classical edifice, opened in 1686 as a coaching inn and resort for visiting merchants. It was the political headquarters of Sir Robert Walpole, who represented the town in Parliament between 1702 and 1742. He is recognised as Britain's first Prime Minister, 2021 being the 300th anniversary of his appointment. His collection of paintings by the great masters at nearby Houghton Hall encouraged the Georgian merchant rulers of the borough to have copies made of Rubens, Claude, Rembrandt and Van Dyck. The hotel provided the location for several decades of the festival's annual literary luncheon. In 1972, it was chaired by Sir John Betjeman, whose love of historic Lynn is well known. One of his favourite walks in England was from St Nicholas Chapel to Nelson Street. Town tours and excursions to Norfolk's great houses and village churches have been included in festival programmes since 1951. Not far from the Tuesday Marketplace is St Nicholas Chapel, which is in the custody of the Church's Conservation Trust. A major restoration project was undertaken over 2013-15 following a grant of £2.3 million from the National Heritage Lottery Fund and fundraising by the Friends of St Nicholas Chapel in partnership with the Church's Conservation Trust. It is England's largest parochial chapel and was rebuilding from the 1380s for completion by 1415, funded by the donations of merchants and townspeople. The chapel had been founded in 1146 by the Norwich bishops as a chapel of ease to St Margaret's Priory Church. The tower was erected in the early 13th century. The present magnificent stone and brick perpendicular medieval building was almost certainly designed to rival St Margaret's. It is, perhaps, the best example in Norfolk of the influence of the friars who erected big hall churches to preach to the growing urban populations of medieval England. The chapel is 203 feet long with 11 bays. The chapel doors had been restored and rededicated by the Bishop of Lynn in 2013 in their medieval colours of red and green. Above is the great west window, which lights up the interior. It has been restored several times. The spire is Victorian. The medieval spire fell during the great gale of 8 September 1741, and was eventually replaced by the wooden lead-covered spire designed by Gilbert Scott in 1871. Old and new spires were important sea marks for vessels approaching King's Lynn in past centuries. St Nicholas is the patron saint of merchants and sailors, and most Hanseatic port towns have a church dedicated to him. There are important mural monuments projecting the wealth and authority of local merchants, of which those belonging to Thomas Green, 1675, and Samuel Brown, 1784, are noteworthy. Benjamin Keane had been British ambassador in Madrid and Lisbon through Walpole's patronage. On his monument is a scene from the port of Lisbon, from where Lynn merchants shipped wine to England. The chapel became a popular venue for festival concerts, both for audience capacity and its marvellous acoustics, as well as magnificent architecture. 
A distinctive feature of the chapel are the 24 roof angels, of whom 10 were holding musical instruments, telling us how important music has been in this heavenly place, a tradition enriched by the festival. In 1951, there was just a single festival event at St Nicholas, with Kathleen Ferrier and Peter Pears in a choral concert. This was Haydn's Nelson Mass. In July 1952, Sir John Barbara Raleigh conducted the London Symphony Orchestra in a festival orchestral concert at the chapel. It included Vaughan Williams's Symphony in D Major. The young Dr Williams was introduced to the folk singers of the close-knit fishing community, living in the streets and yards around the great St Nicholas Chapel. In just a week, in January 1905, he collected at least 61 folk songs in Kings Lynn, and most from the North End fisher folk, which reflected the town's maritime heritage and profoundly influenced the music of the composer. The orchestras and choirs are located on the dais in the chancel with the impressive Victorian east window beyond. Sir John Barbaroli frequently brought the Halle Orchestra to the festivals of the 1950s and 1960s. He loved Kingston Festival for its unique charm and simplicity. His services to the town and festival led to Sir John being created an honorary borough freeman. He is seen here with his scroll. Rostropovich, 1927-2007, the Russian cellist and conductor, was regarded as one of the world's greatest musicians of the 20th century. He first appeared at the festival in 1985, then again in 1988, when he was seen wheeling his cello through the narrow streets of Kings Lynn to play at St Nicholas Chapel. Yehudi Menuhin and his festival orchestra performed with Nigel Kennedy at St Nicholas Chapel during the 1975 festival, the 25th festival. The music was by J.S. Bach, concerto in D minor for two violins and string orchestra. Well, the joy of this place is the acoustic. How did they get it so right in 1400? Uh, any of the performers who come here say that it remains in their memory. Uh, it really is an astonishing place and the sound goes so perfectly down the nave here. The most regular orchestra we have here is the EU Chamber Orchestra and they've recorded prize-winning Mozart in here. So that's the, the quality of the sound. Or you can even hear the Henry Willis organ. After all, this is the last one built in his lifetime in 1900. He was the father of Victorian organ building. So what I want you to imagine is the long view over the pews, 600-odd uh, seats here uh, all the way through, and in its heyday, a mass of chairs at the back, plastic chairs that were a five or a time to, to be in a most marvellous concert. And then extraordinarily, in the middle here, there was a raised stage and then tiered uh, seats on scaffolding all the way back to that east window you can see behind me. I remember sitting up there and feeling that I was incredibly close to James Galway's flute end, the man with the golden flute. And uh, in the 70s and 80s through to the middle 90s, there were 1,200 people in here for the major concerts. Absolutely staggering. If I think of the musicians that we've had in here in recent years, at one end, the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, uh, the other end of the same scale, the violinist, Tasmin Little, uh, another one, Crispin Steele Perkins, a trumpeter, but he can make a noise out of almost anything, quite extraordinary musician. Another big band sound, the Fairy Aviation Band, and the Kingsland Festival Chorus musters 120 singers standing on tiered staging. They will bring us oratorios and requiems. And we even have uh, the college students practicing a rock gig uh, and the Friends of Runner Cayley. Everything sounds better in here. King Street, where you will find St George's Guildhall, is the grandest historic street in the town, where several houses have been used for festival exhibitions over the decades. At the end of King Street is the Custom House. As well as Lynn's glorious medieval guild halls and churches, the 1951 festival embraced the historic riverside streets and maritime heritage of King's Lynn. 
The classical custom house sponsored by the Turners opened in 1685 as a place for merchants to resort and it housed an exhibition on Norfolk Admirals in 1951. This exceptional architectural masterpiece by Henry Bell had its exterior cleaned for the 1951 festival. In the extensive wine cellars under adjacent Kingstate Square, the festival organised a German wine tasting event in 1981. Kings Lynn imported large quantities of wine from southern Europe from the 13th to the 18th centuries for distribution upriver to 10 English counties. Kingstate Square was made an urban space ideal for public performances and concerts in 2000. It was part of the borough's Millennium Project. Before that, the Festival Fringe in the 1970s had included late-night reviews at the Mill Theatre, an early 18th-century mustard mill at the southeast corner of the square and now a private house. Clifton House in Queen Street is the grandest merchant house in town. Behind its 1708 classical portal, a Tudor tower and medieval tile floor and undercroft can all be found. The Borough Council purchased this exceptional merchant mansion with warehouses to save it from likely demolition in 1948. It was used for festival exhibitions. In 1951, publications and letters belonging to the nationally famous 18th century Burney family associated with Kings Lynn were on view. Dr Charles Burney had visited the house in the 1750s to teach Miss Robertson, the daughter of a wine merchant, the harpsichord. In 1957, the 14th century undercroft at Clifton House was the location for Treasures of East Anglian Churches, an exhibition curated by Gustav Metzger. One of his aims was to make one of the town's most interesting architectural features better known. Metzger had also organised a small exhibition by young British sculptors at his antique shop in Queen Street to coincide with the 1956 July Festival. The 2019 festival exhibition was devoted to the work of Gustav Metzger. This view from the Tower of Clifton House shows the long town hall, with the medieval hall extended by the brick assembly rooms. Further down Queen Street is Thorsby College, built by 1511, which is the headquarters of the Kings Inn Preservation Trust, and the hall hosted festival events following its restoration in the 1960s. From Queen Street, we arrive at the Saturday Marketplace and Town Hall. The assemble of exceptional medieval and later buildings hugging the Saturday Marketplace announces that Kings Lynn was once in the Premier League of English towns. The Town Hall or Trinity Guild Hall is the civic hub of the borough of Kings Lynn and West Norfolk. It was largely rebuilt in 1422-23 with the impressive assembly rooms behind. They were built in 1767. The medieval hall and the 18th century assembly rooms are accessed by the tall classical porch erected in 1624. The medieval hall was the venue for plays and music making hosted by the mayor for the urban and landed gentry. He had his own band from the 1360s known as the Lynn Waits, who also played in the streets. In 1548, Kings Lynn's religious guilds were dissolved and the Trinity Guild Hall became the town hall and headquarters of the merchant rulers who formed the new corporation. The great south window lighting the hall was rebuilt in 1766 and its windows on the east and west sides lost in the 18th century through adjoining buildings. Travelling players from London were performing here in the 1580s and 1590s with the upper crust of Kings Linen District, the audience. There were concerts in the hall in the 1750s when the new turnpike roads facilitated travel by musicians from other towns. Richard Sly was a violinist who played in concerts in 1766 and 1767, supported by Norwich musicians. These orchestras must have been quite large, as French horns and kettle drums are listed. The assembly rooms were built to accommodate bigger balls and concerts. One bay of the medieval hall was lost in the process. The minstrel's gallery between the two big chimney stacks on the east wall was removed in 1845. The six brass chandeliers in the assembly rooms were made in the City of London and installed in 1768. No other town hall in England has such a complete set of brass chandeliers. The sixth chandelier 
can be found in the adjacent card room, which completes the assembly rooms. Here is the portrait of Sir Robert Walpole by Jonathan Richardson, gifted by this Kingsland MP and Prime Minister to the corporation. He advanced the diplomatic career of Sir Benjamin Keane, whose portrait after Louis Michel Van Loo can be found in the card room. Across the room, he faces Captain George Vancouver, 1757-1798, painted by William Bright Morris. This Kingsland sailor had sailed with Cook, but his own great voyage, 1791 to 1795, included an impressive survey of the west coast of North America. Fanny Burney was born in Kingsland in 1752, the second daughter of Esther and Charles Burney. She became a celebrity following the publication of her first novel called Evelina in 1778. The town hall was the location of festival balls and dinners in the 1950s and 1960s. Ruth Fermoy and Patrick Hadley organised winter lunchtime concerts here before and after 1951 to raise money for the restoration of the Guildhall in King Street. The latter was Professor of Music at Cambridge and worked with Lady Fermoy on the annual festival programmes. The Kingston Civic Society also arranged concerts of classical music at the Town Hall to support the restoration project in King Street. The festival's morning coffee concerts in the Town Hall have been very popular in recent decades, with young musicians, solo or string quartets, delighting concert goers on warm July days. In 2018, the Polish cellist Matsin Zdunik, pictured here, was the festival's artist-in-residence, whose playing has won deserved praise throughout Europe. Such coffee concerts are also programmed in the spring and autumn and draw good audiences. Festival lectures have been regular events at the Town Hall. Some have been on Kingsland history and culture, for example, the Hanseatic League and the North End Fisherfolk. In 1951, Peter Ustinov spoke on the nature of the theatre and Percy Schools on the Burney family. Ralph Vaughan Williams gave a brilliant lecture at the Town Hall during the 1952 festival on East Anglian folk song, inspired by the songs he had collected in King's Lynn in 1905. His audience included Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret. He emphasised to his audience how such traditional songs handed down through the generations were central to our national heritage and that their beauty will not fade. The Town Hall has also been the venue for the annual poetry and literary festivals, which have greatly contributed to the cultural life and standing of the town since the 1980s. Kings Lynn Festival is unique. They bring to Kings Lynn and the whole of West Norfolk international, national musicians, drama to the Guildhall stage, lecturers, and um, it, it makes such a difference for two weeks in um, the summer here in Kings Lynn. It brings a different atmosphere, it's just a vibrant atmosphere in the town centre. What we like about the Kings Lynn Festival, it's not just for residents of West Norfolk. We have many, many visitors from all over the country come to stay in West Norfolk, uses our restaurants, view our heritage, and of course, with the fantastic programme of events during that two weeks, they, they attend these festival events. And, and of course, the Kingsley Festival is famous because it's had royal patronage, the Queen Mother used to visit, and it's been going on for many, many years, so it's got a really fantastic reputation, something which Kingsley Borough Council are, are proud to give them a grant to, to support them and sponsor usually sponsor the last evening event. I personally have known um, and have attended the Kings Lynn Festival for many years when my daughters were young, and so therefore when I became a councillor, I knew the reputation the Kings Lynn Festival has. So I encouraged the Borough Council to support them by giving a grant. And as I'm um, a representative of the Borough Council, I also sit on the Kings Lynn Festival board. It helps Kings Lynn to be named the festival town. And it's all really down to the Kingsland Festival being um, putting on such a fantastic event for 70 years. Kingsland Minster, St Margaret's Priory Church. The twin towers of St Margaret's Priory Church 
have remained a majestic landmark and sea mark through the centuries. The Benedictine Priory was dissolved in the 1530s, but its southern range has survived. St Margaret's was made a Minster Church in 2011. St Margaret's Priory Church was founded circa 1100 by Bishop Lozinger of Norwich. It tells of the wealth and piety of medieval merchants and townspeople. It was rebuilt in gleaming limestone on its present grand scale in the 13th century. The church is 235 feet long, followed by its enhancement in the 1480s by a spire on the southwest tower and a central lantern, though the nave is somewhat smaller than before 1741. Then, a great gale blew down the 15th century spire on the southwest tower, which crashed into the nave, which had to be rebuilt, and this was achieved by 1747. King George II and Robert Walpole each gave £1,000 to the appeal fund. The ornate stucco ceiling and galleries were torn out during the restoration of 1875 in an attempt to return to the medieval past. This portrait of Dr Charles Burney was painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds in 1781 and now hangs in the National Portrait Gallery. This popular musician and historian is wearing the Oxford Doctor of Music gown. The doctorate was awarded in 1769. In 1751 he took up his post as organist at St Margaret's. Burney persuaded the corporation to invest £700 in a new organ built by Johann Snetzler with an extra £37 required for the carriage of the parts overland from London. It was installed in St Margaret's in 1754 against the Great West Window. The organ soon acquired nationwide admiration for the quality of its sound. The famous Snetzler organ was removed from the west end of the nave to this location in 1870. In October 1754, Charles Burney was the organist for what seems to have been the first performance outside London of Handel's Zadok the Priest, supported by musicians from several towns. This famous organ is a landmark in the development of organ building in England, though since 1754 it has undergone restorations. In the 1750s, Charles Burney not only organised concerts of religious music in the church, but balls and subscription concerts in the town hall opposite. Unsurprisingly, the Snetzler has featured in festival organ recitals many times since 1951, including 2014 on the bicentenary of Burney's death. The Academy of Ancient Music played at St Margaret's in 1980 during the 30th festival. It had been founded in 1973 by Christopher Hogwood, who became the festival's artistic director in 1975. Its programme celebrated the music of that great English composer, Henry Purcell. On the festival's early music day in July 2010, the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment played Handel, Purcell and Bach. In 1988, Stephen Cleabury's organ recital had included works by Buxterhood and Bach. The latter had walked 250 miles from Arnstadt to Lübeck to listen to Buxterhude in 1705. In the south aisle of the chancel, the impressive 14th century Flemish brass of Robert Braunch and his wives includes a peacock feast with musicians playing for the VIP assembly, an interesting link to the festival's early music concerts. The York Waits and the Watlington Players performed here in 1998, telling the story of the town's famous religious mystic and pilgrim, Marjorie Kemp, who lived from 1373 to around 1440. It inspired the Baromere of the time to revive the Kingslyn Waits, or Civic Band, established in the 1360s, but made redundant in 1835. Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother, is seen here with the composer Benjamin Britten, and the Reverend Eric Turnbull. The photograph was probably taken during the 1966 festival when Britain was involved in a production by the English Opera Group at St Margaret's. Charles Burney, who was one of the most significant figures of the 18th century in music, was organist here for eight years. He wrote a major history of music. He wrote two travel diaries across Europe. He met everybody from Handel to J.C. Bach right up into the early 19th century. Uh, and of course, Kingsley has a, a, a longer musical history because the Lestrange family in Hunstanton 
had John Jenkins as their resident musician who taught the viol and wrote many pieces for consorts of viols, favourite pieces for viol players. And Lestrange himself was actually license, licensor of music for Charles II, and he was a good viol player himself. So King's Lynn really has a, an important musical history and heritage. We're very lucky in King's Lynn to have such wonderful historic churches uh, with Terrific acoustics, absolutely perfect for music, for classical music, perfect for the festival. Kingston Minster has hosted the July Festival services since 1951 to begin the annual feast of wonderful music in the town's exceptional historic buildings. The sermons have been given by a number of inspirational speakers, including bishops from many parts of the country. Opposite Kings Lynn Minster is the Hansa House, which is the sole medieval trading post of the Hanseatic League of German Towns to have survived in England. Merchants from Lübeck, Hamburg and Danzig redeveloped the site in the years after 1475, when it was gifted to them by Edward IV. Trade routes crisscrossing Europe's seas were followed in the 16th and 17th centuries by artists and musicians. Touring companies of English actors and musicians visited the Hanseatic towns by 1600, particularly Hamburg, with which Kings Lynn has had connections for 800 years. On the way from the Saturday marketplace to South Lynn via Nelson Street and Bridge Street, there are several historic houses which have accommodated festival events. On the corner of Nelson Street is the former Valiant Sailor Public House, where the town's greatest 20th century artists lived in the 1950s. Walter Dexter. His work was exhibited at Lynn Museum in the 1951 festival. Opposite is the restored Hampton Court of the 14th and 15th centuries, and further along the west side of Nelson Street is Oxley House, a fine Georgian house. Both Hampton Court and Oxley House have accommodated festival events in the past. All Saints Church and South Lynn. South Lynn Parish led an independent life until 1555, when integrated with King's Lynn. Until the 1850s, the parish was a maritime community, with shipbuilding on the River Nar and many master mariners living in the nearby streets. All Saints is the town's oldest church and a Saxon foundation, rebuilt about 1095 and enlarged before 1500. Its transepts were added circa 1280. A much larger nave was constructed in the 14th century with a west tower, which unfortunately fell in 1763. Parts of the medieval rood screen have survived with panels showing six painted apostles. A medieval anchorite cell is the prominent feature where a succession of anchorites and anchoresses resided in the 15th century. Their cell is naturally against the warmer south wall of the chancel. Over recent decades, All Saints has attracted good audiences to summer festival events. In the 1980s, there was a series of morning chamber music concerts. The pattern seems to have been set by the Endelian String Quartet, which played Mozart over five mornings in the church in the 1984 festival. The BBC recorded these coffee concerts before their transfer to the town hall. The church acoustics are ideal for such wonderful music. The organ was installed in 1926 and made by a London firm. Early evening organ recitals have been part of festival programmes. The church also hosts a concert for the annual Kings Lynn Hansa Festival, 2020 accepted, including the music of composers from Hamburg and Lübeck. 70 years the festival's been running and it's a really important event for Kings Lynn, brings people from all over the country to fill the hotels and the restaurants and to share the wonderful things that we, events we stage. And All Saints Church here is, is a, an, an important venue which has been used right from the very early festivals. Um, it's obviously very, very good for smaller scale events. Um, one of uh, the very popular ones have been, and it's just one example, is that we've had several of the um, Prince of Wales harpist, their, his official harpist have played here and because the intimacy is just superb and the audience can see really well. 
one very memorable year was 1986 when the BBC recorded six morning recitals in this church Monday to Saturday by the Tachak String Quartet. So the, the churchyard was just full of all the BBC's wagons and these huge coils of, of cables, which of course wouldn't happen now, but all coming in all the doors and things. But it, that was a great honour for Kings Lynn Festival for them to do deem it to be serious enough to, to put all those resources in to do something and it because it was all broadcast subsequently on radio 3 the this church has really seen some wonderful um, performances over the years and will do more and you know as i say throughout throughout the festival's history it is an important venue for us and because it's really good because it's out of the way it brings audiences here and people discover this church and this area and and all the history that is here. It is the oldest church in Kings Lynn, so it's very significant. Also, I would like to um, just mention all the people who support the festival, the people who sponsor the events, and just about every event is sponsored by individuals and by businesses in West Norfolk, which we so appreciate. And we've got patrons and many, many friends and does so much to put Kings Lynn on the map. And it's so enriching, not just for West Norfolk people, but for the people who build a holiday round coming to Kings Lynn in the summer. So um, it's an opportunity to express our very great thanks to all of them as well. British festivals of music and the arts were all casualties in 2020 of the COVID-19 epidemic. So Kings Lynn celebrated its 70th festival in July 2021, faithful to its tradition of wonderful music being played in glorious historic buildings, with exhibitions, talks and walks too. All Saints remains an important festival venue. Kings Lynn Festival early acquired national and even international acclaim for excellence for the quality of its annual programme of music and the arts, performed in exceptional historic buildings. After 70 years, it continues as a major cultural and social event, with stimulating programmes in the autumn and spring, as well as in July. To appeal to all generations and audiences is a constant aim of the director's and the staff team. So to discover more about Lynn and the Festival um, of Music and the Arts started in 1951 and all the people associated with it and the famous musicians and artists and other people with their own festivals in Kings Lynn, giving Kings Lynn this image of a festival town. So what this film will hopefully do is to raise the profile even more because we'd like to do that and reach even more people of Kings Lynn, a glorious festival town. Thank you.